The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. DuPont presents episodes in the life of America's first great novelist, James Fenimore Cooper. In the ranks of the Cavalcade of America march many sturdy pioneers in all fields of endeavor. Exploration, business, commerce, statecraft, art, and science. Possibly no other nation over the same span of years can point to so many splendid achievements of her sons and daughters. Among these pioneers are also the research chemists, to whom we owe many of the comforts and conveniences we enjoy today. Their contributions are aptly summed up in the DuPont Pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. As an overture, Don Voorhees and his DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra join two unrelated subjects, James Fenimore Cooper's Indian Legends and St. Patrick's Day by playing an excerpt from Natoma, the American Indian opera by the great Irish-American composer, Victor Herbert. James Fenimore Cooper was born in 1789. During his youth, which was passed in western New York, then a wilderness, he showed no aptitude for books or writing. After two years at Yale, at the age of 19, 
He secured a commission as midshipman in the United States Navy. In 1811, he resigned, married Susan DeLancey of Westchester, and settled down to the domestic life of a country gentleman. One evening in 1820, in his Westchester home near Mamaroneck, we find Cooper reading aloud to his wife from an English novel which has just been received in America. I beg your forgiveness, my fair lady Vera. The manly form of Lord Edmund knelt by the side of the beautiful but proud heiress of Rosewood Manor. His dark eyes besought hers. Oh. James, throwing a book on the floor? Oh, just trash. In our eight years of marriage, I've never seen you display such temper. The book seems to me as entertaining as any of Mrs. Opie's other novels. Entertaining, Sue? Why, I could write a better book myself. Oh, James. I mean it. You write a book? <laughs> Why, you who admit being the worst penman in America. James, you told me the principal reason you agreed to live here in Westchester was so you'd be spared the need of writing to me when I came home to visit my parents. <laughs> well, there's some truth in that, my dearest Sue. But I still maintain I could write a better book than this trash from England. James Cooper. All right, I challenge you to do it. Why, I, I had not meant that I'd actually said about the writing of a book, Sue. Then you shouldn't make empty boasts. Well, there'd be no harm in trying. The most difficult part of writing a novel must be to start it. Well, then, I accept your challenge. For your private amusement, Susan, I'll write one novel. But no one must ever know. James Fenimore Cooper would never have completed that first novel if his wife had not continued to challenge him. And solely to please her, he printed a few hundred copies at his own expense. In the tradition of the early 19th century, it was a story of English high society, and it appeared without the author's name. One evening, a few weeks after the book is printed, Cooper and his wife dine at the Westchester home of their intimate friend, Judge John Jay. In the drawing room after dinner, Cooper is startled to hear one of the guests, Miss MacDonald, discussing his book. Have you read the new novel called Precaution, Mr. J? Yes, Miss MacDonald, I have. Interesting book. Interesting enough. But I am indignant with the booksellers. Say that American gentlemen wrote it. I can state emphatically it was written by an English woman. Why do you suppose the booksellers state that an American wrote it, Miss MacDonald? Oh, I can't answer that, Mr. J. But I'm sure it's a fraudulent statement. That book was undoubtedly written by the English novelist, Mrs. Opie. One of her poorer books, of course. One of her poorer books, Miss MacDonald. Why, I thought it a better novel than any Mrs. Opie ever wrote. Well, each of us to her taste. Gracious, is that nine o'clock? My coach must be at the door. It has been a delightful evening, Mr. J. And it has been a pleasure, Mrs. Cooper, to see you and Mr. Cooper again. Thank you, and good night, Miss MacDonald. Oh, uh, Mr. Cooper, when you have read this new book, Precaution... Please let me know if you do not agree that Mrs. Opie wrote it. I'll read it with interest, Miss MacDonald, and let you know my opinion. Good night. Good night. I shall escort you to your carriage, Miss MacDonald. Be back in just a moment, Mr. and Mrs. Cooper. Well. James, please don't be distressed. Before Mr. J gets back, I want to tell you, it really is a compliment, Miss MacDonald, thinking Mrs. Opie wrote your book. Mm, one of Mrs. Opie's poorer novels, she said. And I set out to do a better one. I think it's an admirable book, James. No other Westchester gentleman could have done as well. But don't you see what I've done? I've imitated those atrocious novels of Mrs. Opie with her English society and lords and ladies. I've never been in London, yet I tried to write about it. But all English novels are about society people. Well, not these new Waverley novels, Sue. Oh, but you couldn't write books like those, James. You've never been to Scotland, either. No. The only country I know is America. Westchester. Cooperstown. Lake Otsego. Yes, and no one ever writes about America. It's too rough, too crude, too new. Well, there's nothing in America to interest readers. I wonder. Sue, so, dearest, I'm ashamed of myself. I wrote precaution because of an idle boast, and I failed. I'm so angry with myself, I'm going to have to write one more book. And this time I'll write about something I really know.
challenged by failure, James Fenimore Cooper now challenged himself to write a book. At last it was completed, and in the hands of his bookseller and publisher friend, Charles Wiley. Cooper has made the long trip from Westchester to New York City to visit Wiley and to hear the verdict on his second book, entitled The Spy. He greets Wiley hopefully. Well, Wiley, have you read it? Cooper, you've been my friend for several years. I wish there were a gentle way of telling you what I must tell you today. Wiley, you... You mean you don't like the book? This is the strangest book I've read in all my years as a bookseller and publisher. I'm sorry, but it's not worth wasting paper to print and bind it. You found no merit in the book whatsoever? Well, can't you yourself see the faults of the book? You're an intelligent man, Cooper. Surely you must know no book like this has ever been written. A book whose setting is the American wilderness. Is it your honest judgment that no American would read a book about his own country? Well, it's the judgment of any sane man, Cooper. Americans want to read of life and manners in polished European circles. They know too much about Indians and rough frontiersmen already. I'm afraid you're right, Wiley. My wife's enthusiasm led me to be too hopeful of the book. <laughs> and to think, I'd come here today intending to offer you the copyright at a small price. Well, I'm sorry, Cooper, but I don't dare gamble on it. <laughs> I understand, Wiley. And I appreciate your frankness. <laughs> it's a funny thing. After I completed two chapters, I would have burned them. But my wife begged me to finish the book. And now she tells me it's her dream to see it printed. I think to please her, I'll print it myself. <laughs> Charles Wiley lived to regret his refusal to buy the copyright of the spy. Despite the fact that books were distributed slowly in those days of stagecoaches and packet boats, scarcely a year had passed before the spy had been declared a remarkable piece of fiction. James Fenimore Cooper was hailed in this country and even in London as America's first novelist. Encouraged this time by success, Cooper wrote one more novel, The Pioneer, and still another, The Pilot. But his most famous book was yet to be written. In the year 1825, James Cooper is at home, recovering slowly from a serious illness. One afternoon, his devoted wife, Sue, hurries to his bedside as he calls in a feeble voice. Sue, dear. Yes, James. Please bring me a paper and pen. Oh, but James, you're not strong enough to hold a pen. And the doctor says... Oh, it... bother the doctor. There's something I must set on paper this minute. There, there, James. Now, please don't excite yourself, dear. Your favorite pen is here, right on this table. Now, I have Martha bring the paper. Martha? Yes, Miss Susan? Will you please bring some sheets of paper at once to Mr. Cooper? They're on the desk in the drawing room. Yes, Miss Susan. I'll search and do that. Glens Falls. The cave on the rocky island. A perfect hiding place for Indians. The ideal setting. Yes, dear. I remember you told me about your trip to Glens Falls last summer. It must have been a beautiful sight. Uncas. The last of his tribe. The Mohegans. That's it. The last of the Mohegans. Uh, uh, Susan, where is that paper? I'll set me the paper you write for, Martha Cooper. Here it is. Uh, and the pen? It's here, James, dear. Oh, please, you must not sit up, dear. You're not strong enough. No, I can help pull Martha Cooper up in the bed. Yeah. Oh, my back Take seems it to be breaking too much. James. I can't do it. I, I can't hold the pen. I have an idea, James. You tell me what it is you want to say, and I'll write it. I'll write a fairly legible hand. <laughs> Far more legible than mine. Are you ready to write, Sue? Just a moment, dear. There, I'm ready. The breech of Hawkeye's rifle fell on the naked head of his adversary, whose muscles... Oh, wait, not quite so fast, dear. Whose muscles appeared to wither under the shock. Yes? When Uncas had brained his first antagonist, he turned like a hungry lion to seek another. Suddenly darting at each other, the two combatants closed and came to the earth twisting together like like twining serpents in pliant and subtle folds. Worse than almost. Covered as they were with dust and blood, the swift evolution of the two men seemed to incorporate their bodies into one. Oh, Lord. The fiery eyes of Magua were seen glittering like the fable organs of the basilisk. James, James, dear, are you sure you're strong enough to do this today? Your yeah, Martha Cripple come out and... Wait just a second, James. Hmm. I, uh, I need another sheet of paper. Martha, yeah. send for the doctor at once. It's horrible. Oh, yes. The word Mr. Cooper's telling me to write sounds like a nightmare. I, 
I'm afraid he's delirious again. Oh, the poor man. He sure is raving, Miss Ruth. Well, I'd go on like green lightning for that doctor. Susan. Yes? Where are you going? I'm not finished. I must get this one scene on paper. I'm right here, dear. Uh, what, uh, what was the last line I gave you? Wait. The, uh, the fiery eyes of Magua were seen glittering like the fabled organs of the battle. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, the Mohegan now found an opportunity to make a powerful thrust with his knife. Magua suddenly fell backward without a motion. Victory to the Mohegan, cried Hawkeye, elevating the butt of his long and fatal rifle. And in this manner was born the book which was to assure James Fenimore Cooper's immortality, The Last of the Mohicans. Let us turn the pages and recall some of its stirring scenes. Its hero, the noble Indian Uncas, soon ranked in popularity here and abroad with Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe. The setting of this dramatic narrative of frontier and Indian life is the wilderness of northern New York State. Now, as our scene opens, Uncas, with ear to the ground, warns his friend, the white hunter Hawkeye, that men are approaching. Hey, your ears are top on mine, Uncas. I hear nothing. The horses of white men are close to us. Yeah, it is true. The leader comes in sight. The two young ladies riding close behind. Fools to venture into these woods infested as they are of Hurons. Who come? Two young ladies and an English officer who journeyed since the rising sun and are sadly weary. Whoa. 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 You're lost, then? We fear so. Whoa, boy. Then. I'm Major Hayward. These two young ladies are the daughters of Colonel Monroe, commanding officer of the English fort called William Henry. Know you the distance to the fort? <laughs> yeah, then you are lost if you seek William Henry. Oh, I said as much. We trusted to a friendly Indian guide, but he seems to have lost his way. An Indian lost in the woods? Not possible. Well, what tribe is he? The tribe called Huron. Huron? Did you hear that, Uncas? Mm. They're a thievish tribe. Where is your guide? I ordered him to ride behind because I suspected he was leading us in the wrong direction. Magua! Magua! The Indian is gone, Duncan. He slipped away in the woods this very moment. I oh. told you, the Hurons are a lion, treacherous bunch of armaments. And these woods are full of them, all on the warpath. If we don't leave this spot at once and cover our tracks with Indian cunning, our scalps will be drying in that wind before this hour tomorrow. Oh, Duncan, are we truly in such danger? You have no fear, Alice. I'm sure these kind friends will guide us part of the way to the fort. We must reach it before nightfall. Before nightfall? Look at the sky. Darkness will soon be on us. Then heaven help us. Hawkeye, we take pale face officer and squaws to cave. Conquest, have you taken leave of your senses? The island cave is our only hiding place, a secret known only to us. It would be fatal to take such a large party there. The Hurons would trace us too readily. These young ladies are in my care. Their, their father awaits them anxiously. He and I will be glad to reward you with gold. Plenty of gold when we reach the fort. Uncas does not want gold. Uncas will not leave pale face squaws to tomahawks of Durant. We take them to cave, Hawkeye. As Hawkeye feared, the whinnying of the girls' horses betray the secret hiding place on the island of Glens Falls. But thanks to the skill of Uncas and Hawkeye and the last of their powder, the Hurons are repulsed temporarily. Uncas, who has been scouting, returns to the cave where Hawkeye, the English travelers, and Uncas' father, Chingagook, are waiting. You return from the river empty-handed, Uncas? Bad news, Hawkeye. Canoe floats away. One of them rascally Hurons guided it. They were lost. You mean that the, the Hurons discovered your canoe and sent it adrift? The end has come. The Sagamore, my father, has spoken. A sorry end for a man who's passed 30 years in the forest to be taken without being able to fire a shot in self-defense. Is it really true? Are we surrounded by hostile Indians? Only too true, Miss Alice. Is there nothing that we can do? The end has come. Oh, oh how frightful. See, the old chief of the father has laid down his knife and tomahawk. He's preparing for death. Oh, I swore to Colonel Monroe I'd escort his daughter safely to the fort. Oh, Hawkeye, surely there's hope yet. We may prevent the Hurons landing on the island. Prevent their landing, Hayward? With what? The arrows of Uncas or the tears of the women? 
Kigalgook, my brother. Anokos, my boy. We fought our last battle together. Oh, no. Why prepare for death? The path is open on every side. Go, brave men. You're remaining only to protect my sister and me. You know but little of the craft of the Huron, Miss Cora, if you believe the varmints have left a path open to the woods. In the downstream current, it is true, might soon sweep us beyond the reach of their rifles. Then try the river. Why linger to add to the number of their victims? Go to my father at the fort and bring gunpowder and men to our rescue. There's reason in her words. Chingakunk, Uncas. Uh, hear you the words of the dark-eyed woman? Her word, good. Chingakunk, go river. Bring warriors. It is good. You see? The older chief is going. Oh, won't you all go, please? You can't help us here. Cora's right, Hawkeye. Why don't you go, too? I shall remain here with the young ladies. That's enough. Wisdom is sometime given to the young and to women as well as men. I'll join the Mohican chief. Swim down the river and try to bring a rescue party. Goodbye, and God go with you. We're grateful for all you've done, Hawkeye. Farewell. Had our powder held out, this disgrace could never have befallen. Goodbye. God willing, we shall meet again in this or another world. But Uncas is still here. Uncas, go quickly before it is too late. Your father is not being seen. He's safe. It's time for you to follow. Uncas will stay, oh dark-haired one. Uncas, I beg you. Go to my father at the fort. My father and Hawkeye go to fort. Uncas will stay. But hear me, Uncas. You are younger, fleeter of foot than your father or Hawkeye. My sister and I will feel more hopeful if we know that you're on your way to the fort. Uncas will go. If Hurons carry you away, break twigs, bend bushes, make trail, and Uncas will follow. I'm sure of it, Uncas. Go now, quickly. And our gratitude and our prayers will go with you. Within a few hours, the treacherous Huron Magua and a band of savages capture the three whites and force them to ride many miles through the forest. Now in the encampment, Alice, Cora, and Duncan Hayward, closely guarded by several warriors, listen anxiously as some distance away the wily Magua makes an impassioned speech to the Indians. What is Magua saying? Uh, it is easy to guess. He's settling our fate. I can read our fortunes in their faces. There's no hope. And I'm to blame. If only I hadn't trusted that scoundrel Magua to guide us. You could not, Duncan. Until this moment, I believe Uncas would find our trail. Uncas and Hawkeye are many miles away. They swam down the river toward the fort. And Magua led us in the opposite direction. Uncas begged us to mark our trail. I did try to break one overhanging branch, but Magua was watching me. Oh, it wouldn't have mattered, Cora. See? The scoundrel Magua is approaching. The savages are starting their war down. It's too late to expect Uncas now. Oh, Duncan! Stand back, Ellen. I don't intend that any of us will be bound without a struggle. Uh, light as for weep. She is young to die. But you're on like pale as scalp. Don't you dare touch her, you barbarian. You stop her! <laughs> him, don't you? With all my heart, Cora. I should not confess it. Were we not so close to death? He loves you, too. You may go to your grave or go to that. They found him to that tree. Oh, he's still alive. Thank heaven. Oh, Margaret's coming this way again. Cora, I wish I was as brave as you are. I'm frightened. Let us pray to God it will be over quickly. Alice, did you hear that? A crow. You mean the sound with which... I'm just taking a hawk I lost no Yes, Listen. Go! Go! I hear it. I hear it. We can only hope, Alice, and pray. Meanwhile, let us face these barbarians with unconcern. Let us show them that white women as well as white men know how to die. I'll try to be brave, Cora. Uh, light hair, scalp, and dark will soon hang in Magua's wigwam. Ah! Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Kill me quickly. Light as for one to die. Uh, Magua kill. The boy Egan. Okay. Take the cook. Come then. Exterminate the violence. No porter to the king. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. 
kind old dark-haired one. Uncle, oh, I knew you'd come. Our prayers have been answered. Thus, in James Fenimore Cooper's famous novel, The Last of the Mohicans, the noble and romantic Indian hero, Uncas, who dies at length in a final valiant attempt to save Cora, became part of the life and language of almost every American and European of the 19th century. As the first great American novelist, and the first novelist to believe that the American scene merited perpetuation in fiction, James Fenimore Cooper is accorded a high place of honor among the illustrious men and women enrolled in the cavalcade of America. On Sunday, March 21st, winter is officially over, despite snow underfoot in many sections of the country. The Easter season is just about here, and America will soon be stepping out in its new spring wardrobe. Shop windows from coast to coast are bright with new things. Spring fashion shows are attracting audiences in many communities. And one of the most unusual fashion shows I ever heard about is going to be held next week from Tuesday, March 23rd through Saturday, March 27th in the DuPont exhibit on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Why a fashion show in the DuPont exhibit, you may ask? The answer is that this show depicts how chemistry walks hand in hand with fashion in the modern Easter parade, even creating new styles in many cases. For instance, DuPont chemists developed yarns from which new and better fabrics have been woven for women's gowns. They have found ways to treat these and other fabrics so they are water-repellent and crush-resistant. In work with dyes, chemists develop new colors that brighten up a hat, a dress, gloves, or any other part of the spring costume. The smartest washable handbags are made of coated fabrics and plastics. Many a dainty feminine shoe is colored by special leather dyes to match costumes. And the scuffless heels that add so much to the looks and life of feminine footgear are developments of chemistry. So is much of the costume jewelry and decorative buttons, buckles, and other embellishments made of DuPont plastic. And there are hats made partly or entirely of colorful cellophane cellulose film. These and a great many other chemical products that play their part in the creation of new and interesting fashions were unknown to you and me a few years ago. They were in the research and experimental stage then. Today, we take them for granted as part of our equipment for more enjoyable living. In style shows and Easter parades, and throughout the years, the results of DuPont chemical research are represented by new products and improved products, as practical as they are smart and gay. So, you see, even in this field, as in so many others, research chemistry is doing its part to bring us, as DuPont expresses it, better things for better living through chemistry. The House of Glass, incidents in the romantic and colorful life of Henry William Stiegel, first American manufacturer of glass, will be the subject of the broadcast when next week at the same time, DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mm-hmm.